From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the Sunday morning session of the 189th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Sunday morning session of the 189th Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our greetings and love to those of you who are participating in these proceedings throughout the world by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of Mac Wilberg with Brian Mathias and Richard Elliott at the organ. The choir opened this meeting with how wondrous and great, and will now favor us with high on the mountain top. The invocation will then be offered by Elder O. Vincent Halleck, who was released yesterday as a member of the Seventy. The choir will then sing a child's prayer.
Our dear Heavenly Father, with gratitude in our hearts, we gather this morning to give thee thanks for bringing us together in general conference, to hear the messages that have been given to us all thus far, and to hear from the, our leaders this morning. We're grateful to be gathered under thy prophet, Russell M. Nelson. Heavenly Father, we pray for thy guidance spirit to be with us this day so that we may come to understand and know through the messages that will be given our great capacity to, to do good and to be good and to reach out to bless the lives of others who are around us. Would thou bless us now as we proceed with the beginning of this conference session that thy spirit will abide with us. For these things we pray in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
We will now be pleased to hear from Elder Garrett W. Gong of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Sister Christina B. Frankel, who serves as second counselor in the primary general presidency. Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will then address us. Dear brothers and sisters, a primary child is learning to pray. Thank you for the letter A, the letter B, the letter G. The child's prayer continues. Thank you for the letters X, Y, Z. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the number one, the number two. The primary teacher worries but wisely waits. The child says, Thank you for the number five, the number six, and thank you for my primary teacher. She's the only person who's ever let me finish my prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father does hear every child's prayer. With infinite love, he beckons us to come believe and belong by covenant. This world is full of a mirage, illusion, sleight of hand. So much seems transitory and superficial. When we put aside the masks, pretense, crowdsourced likes and dislikes, we yearn for more than fleeting veneer, ephemeral connection, or the pursuit of worldly self-interest. Gratefully, there is a way through to answers that matter. When we come to God's great commandments to love him and those around us by covenant, we do so not as stranger or guest, but as his child at home. The age-old paradox is still true. In losing our worldly self through covenant belonging, we find and become our best eternal self, free, alive, real, and define our most important relationships. Covenant belonging is to make and keep solemn promises to God and each other through sacred ordinances that invite the power of godliness to be manifest in our lives. When we covenant all we are, we can become more than we are. Covenant belonging gives us place, narrative, capacity to become. It produces faith unto life and salvation. Divine covenants become a source of love for and from God, and thereby for and with each other. God, our Heavenly Father, loves us more and knows us better than we love or know ourselves. Faith in Jesus Christ and personal change, repentance, bring mercy, grace, forgiveness. These comfort the hurt, loneliness, injustice we experience in mortality. Being God, our Heavenly Father wants us to receive God's greatest gift, His joy, His eternal life. Our God is a God of covenant. By His nature, He keepeth covenant and showeth mercy. His covenants endure so long as time should last, or the earth shall stand, or there should be one man upon the face thereof to be saved. We are not meant to wander in existential uncertainty and doubt but to rejoice and cherish covenant relations stronger than the cords of death. God's ordinances and covenants are universal in their requirement and individual in their opportunity. In God's fairness, each individual in every place and age can receive saving ordinances. Agency applies. Individuals choose whether to accept offered ordinances. God's ordinances provide guideposts on his path of covenants. We call God's plan to bring his children home, the plan of redemption, plan of salvation, plan of happiness, redemption, salvation, celestial happiness, are possible because Jesus Christ wrought out this perfect atonement. To belong with God and to walk with each other on his covenant path is to be blessed by covenant belonging. 
First, covenant belonging centers in Jesus Christ as mediator of the new covenant. All things can work together for our good when we are sanctified in Christ in the covenant of the Father. Every good and promised blessing comes to those who remain faithful to the end. The happy state of those who keep the commandments of God is to be blessed in all things, temporal and spiritual, and to dwell with God in never-ending happiness. As we honor our covenants, we may sometimes feel we are in the company of angels, and we will be. Those we love and who bless us on this side of the veil and those who love and bless us from the other side of the veil. Recently, Sister Dong and I saw covenant belonging at its tender best in a hospital room. A young father desperately needed a kidney transplant. His family had wept, fasted, and prayed for him to receive a kidney. When news came, a life-saving kidney had just become available. His wife quietly said, I hope the other family is okay. To belong by covenant is, in the words of the Apostle Paul, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Along life's path, we may lose faith in God, but he never loses faith in us. As it were, his porch light is always on. He invites us to come or return to the covenants that mark his path. He waits ready to embrace us, even when we are yet a great way off. When we look with an eye of faith for the patterns, arc, or connected dots of our experience, we can see his tender mercies and encouragement, especially in our trials, sorrows, and challenges, as well as in our joys. However often we stumble or fall, if we keep moving toward him, he will help us a step at a time. Second, the Book of Mormon is evidence we can hold in our hand of covenant belonging. The Book of Mormon is the promised instrument for the gathering of God's children prophesied as a new covenant. As we read the Book of Mormon, by ourselves and with others, whether silently or aloud, we can ask God with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, and receive by the power of the Holy Ghost God's assurance the Book of Mormon is true. This includes assurance Jesus Christ is our Savior, Joseph Smith is the prophet of the Restoration, and the Lord's Church is called by his name, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Book of Mormon speaks by ancient and modern covenant to you who are the children of Lehi, children of the prophets. Your forefathers received covenant promise that you, their descendants, would recognize the voice as if from the dust in the Book of Mormon. That voice you feel as you read testifies you are children of the covenant and Jesus is your good shepherd. The Book of Mormon invites each of us, in Alma's words, to enter into a covenant with the Lord that we will serve him and keep his commands that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon us. When we want to change for the better, as one person put it, to stop being miserable and to be happy being happy. We can become open to direction, help, and strength. We can come by covenant to belong with God and a community of faithful believers and receive the blessings promised in the doctrine of Christ now. Restored priesthood authority and power to bless all his children is a third dimension of covenant belonging. In this dispensation, John the Baptist and the apostles Peter, James, and John have come as glorified messengers from God to restore his priesthood authority. God's priesthood and his ordinances sweeten relationships on earth and can seal covenant relationships in heaven. Priesthood can bless literally from cradle to grave, from an infant's name and blessing to a grave dedication. Priesthood blessings heal, comfort, counsel, a father was angry with his son until forgiving love came as the father gave his son a tender priesthood blessing. 
the only member in her family, a dear young woman was uncertain about God's love for her until she received an inspired priesthood blessing. Across the world, noble patriarchs prepare spiritually to give patriarchal blessings. As the patriarch lays his hands on your head, he feels and expresses God's love for you. He pronounces your lineage in the house of Israel. He indicates blessings from the Lord. Typically thoughtful, one patriarch's wife told me how she and her family invite the spirit, especially on days their papa is giving patriarchal blessings. Finally, the blessings of covenant belonging come when we follow the Lord's prophet and rejoice in temple covenant living, including in marriage. Covenant marriage becomes supernal and eternal as we daily choose the happiness of our spouse and family before our own. As me becomes we, we grow together. We grow old together. We grow young together. As we bless each other across a lifetime of forgetting ourselves, we find our hopes and joys sanctified in time and eternity. While situations differ, when we do all we can, the best we can, and sincerely ask and seek his help along the way, the Lord will guide us in his time and manner by the Holy Ghost. Marriage covenants are binding by mutual choice of those making them, a reminder of God's and our respect for agency and the blessing of his help when we unitedly seek it. The fruits of covenant belonging across family generations are felt in our homes and hearts. Please allow me to illustrate with personal examples. When Sister Gong and I were falling in love toward marriage, I learned about agency and decisions. For a period of time, we were studying in two different countries, in two different continents. It's why I can honestly say I earned a PhD in international relations. <laughs> when I asked Heavenly Father, should I marry Susan, I felt peace. But it was when I learned to pray with real intent, Heavenly Father, I love Susan and want to marry her. I promise I'll be the best husband and father I can be. When I acted and made my best decisions, it was then the strongest spiritual confirmations came. Now, our Gong and Lindsay family search family trees, stories, and photos help us discover and connect through the lived experience of generational covenant belonging. For us, respected progenitors include Great Grandma Alice Blower Bangader, who had three marriage proposals in one day, later asked her husband to rig a foot pedal to her butter churn so she could churn butter, knit, and read at the same time. <laughs> Great Grandpa Lo Kuei Char carried his children on his back and his family's few belongings on a donkey as they crossed the lava fields on Hawaii's Big Island. Generations of family, of Char family commitment and sacrifice bless our family today. Graham Mary Alice Powell Lindsay was left with five young children when her husband and oldest son both died suddenly, just days apart. A widow for 47 years, Graham raised her family with sustaining love from local leaders and members. During those many years, Graham promised the Lord if he would help her, she would never complain. The Lord helped her. She never complained. Dear brothers and sisters, witnessed by the Holy Ghost, everything good and eternal is centered in the living reality of God, our eternal Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and His atonement. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. Testifying of Jesus Christ is a covenant purpose of the Book of Mormon. By oath and covenant, God's restored priesthood authority is intended to bless all God's children, 
including through covenant marriage, generational family, and individual blessings. Our Savior declares, I am Alpha and Omega, Christ the Lord. Yea, I, even I am He, the beginning and the end, the Redeemer of the world. With us at the beginning, He is with us in all our covenant belonging to the end. I so testify in the sacred and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. One of my favorite primary songs begins with these words. I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I know who I am. I know God's plan. I'll follow Him in faith. I believe in the Savior, Jesus Christ. What a simple and beautiful statement of the truth we believe. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we know who we are. We know that God is the Father of our spirits, that we are His children, and He loves us. We lived with Him in heaven before we came to earth. We know God's plan. We were there with Him as He presented it. Our Father in heaven hold, holds pur hold, our Father in heaven's whole purpose. His work and His glory is to enable each of us to enjoy all of His blessings. He provided a perfect plan to accomplish His purpose. We understood and accepted this plan of happiness, plan of redemption and salvation before we came to earth. Jesus Christ is central to God's plan. Through His atonement, Jesus Christ fulfilled His Father's purpose and made it possible for each of us to enjoy immortality and exaltation. Satan, or the devil, is an enemy to God's plan and has been from the beginning. Agency, or the ability to choose, is one of God's greatest gifts to His children. We must choose whether to follow Jesus Christ or to follow Satan. These are simple truths that we can share with others. Let me tell you of a time when my mother shares such a simple truth by simply being open to having a conversation and recognizing an opportunity. Many years ago, my mother was returning to Argentina for a visit with my brother, and my mom um, never liked really flying, so she asked one of my sons to give her a blessing of comfort and protection. He felt prompted to also bless his grandma with special guidance from, and direction from the Holy Ghost to strengthen and touch the hearts of many who were desirous to learn of the gospel. At the Salt Lake Airport, my mother and brother met a seven-year-old girl who was returning home from a skiing trip with her family. Her parents noticed how long she had been talking to my mom and brother and decided to join them. They introduced themselves and their daughter as Eduardo, Maria Susana, and Shada Paul. There was a natural and warm connection to this sweet family. Both families were excited to be traveling together on the same flight to Buenos Aires, Argentina. As their conversation continued, my mother noted that until that moment, they've never heard about the restored Church of Jesus Christ. One of the first questions Susana asked was, would you tell me about that beautiful museum with a golden statue on top? My mom explained that the beautiful edifice was not a museum, but a temple of the Lord, where we make covenants with God so we can return to live with Him one day. Susanna confessed to my mom that before their trip to Salt Lake, she had prayed for something to strengthen her spirit. During the flight, my mom bore her simple but strong testimony of the gospel and invited Susanna to find the missionaries in her hometown. Susanna asked my mom, how will I find him? My mom replied, you can't miss him. They are either two young men dressed in white shirts and ties or two nicely dressed young women, 
and they always wear a tag showing their name and also the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The families exchanged phone numbers and said goodbye at Buenos Aires Airport. Susana, who since then has become my good friend, told me many times that she felt so sad to leave my mom, my mom at the airport. She said, your mom glowed. I can't explain it, but she had a brightness about her that I didn't want to leave behind. As soon as Susana got back to her hometown, she and her daughter Shada went to share this experience with Susana's mom, who lived just a few blocks away from their home. As they were driving, Susana happened to see two young men walking down the street, dressed as my mom described. She stopped the car in the middle of the street, got out, and asked these two young men, are you by chance from the Church of Jesus Christ? They said, yes. Missionaries, she asked. They both replied, yes, we are. She then said, get into my car. You're coming home to teach me. <laughs> you gotta love her. <laughs> Two months later, Maria Susana was baptized. Her daughter, Shada, was also baptized when she turned nine. We are still working on Eduardo, whom we love no matter what. Since then, Susana has become one of the greatest missionaries I have ever met. She's like the Sansa Messiah, bringing many souls to Christ. In one of our conversations, I asked her, what is your secret? How do you share the gospel with others? She told me, it is very simple. Every day before I leave my house, I pray asking Heavenly Father to direct me to someone who needs the gospel in their life. I sometimes take a Book of Mormon or to share with them or pass along cards from the missionaries. And when I start talking to someone, I simply ask them if they've heard about the church. Susanna also said, other times I just smile while I'm waiting for the train. One day, a man looked at me and said, what are you smiling about? He kind of caught me off guard. I replied, I am smiling because I'm happy. He then said, and what are you so happy about? I answered, I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and that make me, makes me happy. Have you heard about it? When he said no, she gave him a pass along card and invited him to attend the upcoming Sunday services. The following Sunday, she greeted him at the door. President Dallin H. Oaks taught, there are three things all members can do to help share the gospel. First, we can all pray for desire to help with the, this vital part of the work of salvation. Second, we can help we can keep the commandments ourselves. Faithful members will always have the Savior Spirit with them to guide them as they seek to participate in the great work of sharing the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Third, we can pray for inspiration of what we can do to share the gospel with others and pray with a commitment to act upon the inspiration you receive. Brothers and sisters, children and youth, can we be like my friend Susanna and share the gospel with others? Can we invite a friend who is not of our faith to come to church with us on Sunday? Or can we perhaps share a copy of the Book of Mormon with a relative or a friend? Can we help others find their ancestors on family search or share with others what we have learned during the week as we have been studying, come follow, come follow me. Can we be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ, and share with others what brings us joy to our lives? The answer to all of these questions is yes, we can do it. In the scriptures, we read that members of the Church of Jesus Christ are sent forth to labor in His vineyard for the salvation of the souls of men. This work of salvation includes mem member missionary work, uh, convert retention, activation of less active members, temple and family history work, 
and teaching the gospel. My dear friends, the Lord needs us to gather Israel. In the Doctrine and Covenants, he has said, Neither take ye thought beforehand what ye shall say, but treasure up in your minds continually the words of life, and it shall be given you at the very hour that portion that shall be meted unto every man. In addition, he has promised us, and if it so be that you should labor all your days in crying repentance unto these people, and bring save it be one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father. And now, if your joy will be great with one soul that you bring that you have brought unto me in the kingdom of my Father, how great will be your joy if you should bring many souls unto me. The primary song I began with concludes with this profound statement. I believe in the Savior Jesus Christ. I'll honor His name. I'll do what is right. I'll follow His light. His truth I will proclaim. I bear witness that these words are true and that we have a loving Father in heaven who is waiting for us to turn to Him to bless our lives and the lives of those around us. May we have the desire to bring our brothers and sisters to Christ is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Franco Elagong. Thank you, choir. Thank you, President Nelson, First Presidency, for already a wonderful general conference week and weekend. A beloved uh, children's fantasy novel written many years ago begins with the sentence, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. The story of Bilbo Baggins is about a most normal and unremarkable hobbit who is presented with a most remarkable opportunity, the wonderful chance at adventure and the promise of a great reward. The problem is that most self-respecting hobbits want nothing to do with adventures. Their lives are all about comfort. They enjoy eating six meals a day when they can get them and spend their days in their gardens swapping tales with visitors, singing, playing musical instruments, and basking in the simple joys of life. However, when Bilbo is presented with the prospect of a grand adventure, something searches deep within his heart. He understands from the outset that the journey will be challenging, even dangerous. There's even a possibility he might not return. And yet, the call to adventure has reached deep into his heart. And so, this unremarkable hobbit leaves comfort behind and enters the path to a great adventure that will take him all the way to there and back again. Perhaps one of the reasons this story resonates with so many is because it is our story too. Long, long ago, even before we were born in an age dimmed by time and clouded from memory, we too were invited to embark on an adventure. It was proposed by God, our Heavenly Father. Accepting this adventure would mean leaving the comfort and security of his immediate presence. It would mean coming to earth for a journey filled with unknown danger and trial. We knew it would not be easy, but we also knew that we would gain precious treasures, including a physical body and experiencing the intense joys and sorrows of mortality. We would learn to strive, to seek, and to struggle. We would discover truths about God and ourselves. Of course, we knew we would make many mistakes along the way. But we also had a promise that because of the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ, 
we could be cleansed of our transgressions, refined and purified in our spirits, and one day resurrected and reunited with those we love. We learned how much God loves us. He gave us life and he wants us to succeed. Therefore, he prepared a savior for us. Nevertheless, our Father in heaven said, thou mayest choose for thyself, for it is given unto thee. There must have been parts of the mortal adventure that worried and even terrified God's children since a large number of our spiritual brothers and sisters decided against it. By the gift and power of moral agency, we determined that the potential of what we could learn and eternally become was well worth the risk. And so, trusting the promise and power of God and his beloved Son, we accepted the challenge. I did, and so did you. We agreed to leave the security of our first estate and embark on our own great adventure of there and back again. And yet, mortal life has a way of distracting us, doesn't it? We tend to lose sight of our great quest, preferring comfort and ease over growth and progress. Still, there remains something undeniable deep within our hearts that hungers for a higher and nobler purpose. This hunger is one reason why people are drawn to the gospel and church of Jesus Christ. The restored gospel is, in a sense, a renewal of the call to adventure we accepted so long ago. The Savior invites us each day to set aside our comforts and securities and join him on the journey of discipleship. There are many bends in this road. There are hills, valleys, and detours. There may even be metaphorical spiders, trolls, and even a dragon or two. But if you stay on the path and trust in God, you will eventually find the way to our glorious destiny and back to our heavenly home. So how do you begin? It's quite simple. First, you need to choose to incline your heart to God. Strive each day to find Him. Learn to love Him. And then let that love inspire you to learn, understand, and follow His teachings and keep God's commandments. The restored gospel of Jesus Christ is given to us in a plain and simple way that a child can understand. Yet, the gospel of Jesus Christ has the answers to the most complex questions in life and has such profound depth and complexity that even with a lifetime of study and pondering, we can scarcely comprehend even the smallest part. If you hesitate in this adventure because you doubt your ability, remember that discipleship is not about doing things perfectly. It is about doing things intentionally. It is your choices that show what you truly are, far more than your abilities. Even when you fail, you can choose not to give up, but rather discover your courage Press forward and rise up. That is the great test of the journey. God knows that you are not perfect, that you will fail at times. God loves you no less when you struggle than when you triumph. Like a loving parent, he merely wants you to keep intentionally trying. Discipleship is like learning to play the piano. 
Perhaps all you can do at first is play a barely rendition, recognizable rendition of chopsticks. But if you continue practicing, the simple tunes will one day give way to wondrous sonatas, rhapsodies, and concertos. Now, that day may not come during this life, but it will come. <laughs> All God asks is that you consciously keep striving. There's something interesting, almost paradoxical, about this path you have chosen. The only way for you to progress in your gospel adventure is to help others progress as well. To help others is the path of discipleship. Faith, hope, love, compassion, and service Refine us as disciples. Through your efforts to help the poor and the needy, to reach out to those in distress, your own character is purified and forged. Your spirit is enlarged, and you walk a little taller. But this love cannot come with expectations of repayment. It cannot be the kind of service that expects recognition, adulation, or favor. True disciples of Jesus Christ love God and his children without expectation of something in return. We love those who disappoint us, who don't like us, even those who ridicule, abuse, and seek to hurt us. When you fill your hearts with the pure love of Christ, you leave no room for rancor, judgment, and shaming. You keep God's commandments because you love him. In the process, you slowly become more Christ-like in your thoughts and deeds. And what adventure could be greater than this? The third thing we strive to master in this journey is to take upon ourselves the name of Jesus Christ and not be ashamed of being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. We do not hide our faith. We do not bury it. To the contrary, we talk about our journey with others in normal and natural ways. That's what friends do. They talk about things that are important to them, things that are close to their heart and make a difference to them. That's what you do. You tell your stories and experiences as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Sometimes your stories make people laugh. Sometimes they bring them to tears. Sometimes they will help people to continue in patience, resilience, and courage to face another hour, another day, and come a little closer to God. Share your experiences in person, on social media, in groups, everywhere. One of the last things Jesus told his disciples was that they were to go throughout the world and share the story of the risen Christ. Today, we too, joyfully, accept that great commission. What a glorious message we have to share. Because of Jesus Christ, every man, woman, and child can return home safely to their heavenly home and there dwell in glory and righteousness. There's even more good news to share. God has appeared to men in our day. We have a living prophet. May I remind you that God does not need you to sell the restored gospel or the church of Jesus Christ. He simply expects you to not hide it under a bushel. And if people decide the church is not for them, that is their decision. It does not mean that you have failed. You continue to treat them kindly, nor does it exclude that you invite them again. 
the difference between casual social contacts and compassionate, courageous discipleship is invitation. We love and respect all of God's children, regardless of their position in life, regardless of their race or religion, regardless of their life's decisions. For our part, we will say, come and see. Find out for yourself how walking the path of discipleship will be rewarding and ennobling. We invite people to come and help as we try to make the world a better place. And we say, come and stay. We are your brothers and sisters. We are not perfect. We trust God and seek to keep his commandments. Join with us and you will make us better. And in the process, you will become better as well. Let's take this adventure together. When our friend Bilbo Baggins felt the call to adventure stare within him, he decided to get a good night's rest, enjoy a hearty breakfast, and start out first thing in the morning. When Bilbo awoke, he noticed his house was a mess, and he was almost distracted from his noble plan. But then his good friend Gandalf came and asked, whenever are you going to come? To catch up with his friends, Bilbo had to decide for himself what to do. And so, the very normal and unremarkable hobbit found himself darting out his front door to the path of adventure so quickly that he forgot his hat, walking stick, and pocket handkerchief. He even left his second breakfast unfinished. Perhaps there is a lesson here for us as well. If you and I have felt the stirrings to join the great adventure of living and sharing what our loving Heavenly Father has prepared for us a long time ago, I assure you, today is the day to follow God's Son and our Savior on His path of service and discipleship. We could spend a lifetime waiting for that moment when everything lines up perfectly. But now is the time to commit fully to seeking God, ministering to others, and sharing our experience with others. Leave behind your head, walking stick, handkerchief, and messy house. To those of us already walking that path, take courage, compassion, have confidence, and continue. To those who have left the path, please come back. Join again with us. Make us stronger. And to those who have not yet begun, why delay? If you want to experience the wonders of this great spiritual journey, set foot upon your own grand adventure. Speak with the missionaries. Speak with your Latter-day Saint friends. Speak with them about this marvelous work and a wonder. It's time to begin. If you sense that your life could have more meaning, a higher purpose, stronger family bonds, and a closer connection with God, please come join with us. If you seek a community of people who are working to become the best versions of themselves, help those in need and make this world a better place, come join with us. Come and see what this marvelous, wondrous, and adventurous journey is all about. Along the way, you will discover yourself. You will discover meaning. You will discover God. You will discover the most adventurous and glorious journey of your life. Of this I testify in the name of our Redeemer and Savior, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The congregation will now join the choir in singing, Teach Me to Walk in the Light. After the singing, we will be pleased to hear from Elder Walter F. Gonzalez of the 70. He will be followed 
by Elder Gary E. Stevenson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This is the 189th semi-annual general conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Roughly 2,000 years ago, the Savior came down from the mountain after teaching the Beatitudes and other gospel principles. As he walked, he was approached by a man sick with leprosy. The man showed reverence and respect as he knelt before Christ, seeking relief from his affliction. His request was simple, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. The Savior then extended his hand and touching him said, I will be thou clean. We learn here that our Savior always wants to bless us. Some blessings may come immediately, others may take longer, and some may even come after this life, but blessings will come in due time. Much like the leper, we can find strength and comfort in this life by accepting his will and knowing that he wants to bless us. We can find the strength to face any challenge, to overcome temptations, and to understand and endure our difficult circumstances. Surely, in the most crushing moment of his life, the Savior's strength to endure was deepened as he said to his Father, Thy will be done. The leper did not make his request in a pretentious or demanding manner. His words reveal a humble attitude with high expectations, but also with a sincere desire that the will of the Savior be done. This is an example of the attitude with which we should come into Christ. We can come into Christ with the certainty that his desire currently is and always will be the best for our mortal and eternal lives. He has an eternal perspective that we not always have. We, or let's come into Christ with a sincere desire that our will be swallowed up in His, which will prepare us for eternal life. 
it's very hard to imagine the physical and emotional suffering that weighed on the leper who came into the Savior. Leprosy affects the nerves and skin, causing disfigurement and disability. Additionally, it led to great social stigma. Someone stricken with leprosy had to leave their loved ones and live isolated from society. Lepers were considered unclean, both physically and spiritually. For this reason, the law of Moses required that lepers wear torn clothing and call out unclean as they walked. Sick and despised, lepers ended up living in abandoned houses or tombs. It's not hard to imagine that the leper who approached the Savior was broken. In one way or another, we too can feel broken, whether due to our own actions or those of others, due to circumstances we can or cannot control. In such moments, we can place our will in his hands. Some years ago, Sulma, my wife, my better half, my best part, received some difficult news. She had a tumor in her parotid gland, and it was growing rapidly. Her face began swelling, and she was to immediately undergo a delicate operation. Many thoughts ran through her mind and weighed on her heart. Was the tumor malignant? How would her body recover? Would her face become paralyzed? How intense the pain be? Would her face be permanently scarred? Would the tumor return once removed? Even if she could attend the wedding of one of our sons that was going to take place two weeks later, as she lay in the operating room, she felt broken. In that very important moment, the Spirit whispered to her that she had to accept the will of the Lord. Then she decided to place her trust in God. She strongly felt that whatever the result, His will would be the best for her. Soon, she drifted into surgical sleep. Later, she wrote poetically in her diary, On the surgeon's table, I bowed before thee, and surrendered to thy will, I fell asleep. I knew I could turn to thee, knowing that nothing bad can come from thee. She found strength and comfort from surrendering her will to that of the Father. That day, God blessed her greatly. Whatever our circumstances might be, we can exercise our faith to come into Christ and find a God we can trust. As my son once wrote, according to the prophet, God's face is brighter than the sun, and his hair is whiter than snow, and his voice roars like the rushing of a river, and next to him man is nothing. I am crushed as I realize that even I am nothing, and only then do I fumble my way to a God I can trust. And only then do I discover the God I can trust. We can trust him because he loves us and wants us what is the best for us in every circumstance. The leper came forward because of the power of hope. And hope is emboldened by a God that we can trust. The world gave him no solutions, not even comfort. Thus the Savior's simple touch must have felt like a caress into his entire soul. We can only imagine the deep feelings of gratitude the leper must have had at the Savior's touch, especially when he heard the words, I will be thou clean. The story states that immediately his leprosy was cleansed. We too can feel the touch of the Savior's loving, healing hand. What joy, hope, and gratefulness comes to our souls in knowing that He wants to help us to be clean. As we come unto Him, God will come to our rescue, whether to heal us or to give us the strength to face any situation. At any rate, accepting His will, not our own, will help us understand our circumstances. Nothing bad can come from God. 
He knows what is the best for us. Perhaps he will not remove our burdens right away. Sometimes he can make those burdens feel lighter as he did with Alma and his people. Ultimately, because of covenants, the burdens will be lifted either in this life or at the holy resurrection. A sincere desire that his will be done, along with an understanding of our Redeemer's divine nature, helps us develop the kind of faith that the leper showed in order to be cleansed. Jesus Christ is a God of love, a God of hope, a God of healing, a God who wants to bless us and help us be clean. That is what he wanted before coming to this earth when he volunteered to rescue us when we fall into transgression. That is what he wanted in Gethsemane when he faced humanly incomprehensible pain during the agony of paying the price of sin. That is what he wants now when, we, when he pleads on our behalf before the Father. That is why his voice echoes still Come unto me, and ye, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He can heal us and lift us up because he has the ability to do it. He took upon himself all the pains of body and spirit so that his bowels would be filled with mercy in order to be able to help us in all things and to heal us and lift us up. The words of Isaiah, as cited by Abinadi, put it beautifully and movingly. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. A similar concept is taught in this poem. O carpenter of Nazareth, this heart thus broken past repair, this life thus shattered nigh to death, oh, can you mend them, carpenter? And by his kind and ready hand, his own sweet life is woven through our broken lives until they stand a new creation, all things new. The shattered substance of the heart, desire, ambition, hope, and faith mold thou into perfect part, O carpenter of Nazareth. If you feel that in any way you are not clean, if you feel broken, please know that you can be made clean, you can be mended because he's, he loves you. Trust that nothing bad can come from him. Because he descended below all things, he makes it possible for all things that have been broken in our lives to be mended. And thus, we can be reconciled with God. Through him, all things are reconciled, both things that are on earth and things that are in heaven, making peace through the blood of his cross. Let us come into Christ, taking all necessary steps as we do May our attitude be one of saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. If we do so, we can receive the master's healing touch alongside the sweet echo of his voice, I will be thou clean. The Savior is a God we can trust. He is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Messiah of whom I testify in his holy name, even Jesus Christ, amen. Today I offer words of counsel for everyone, but especially for you of the rising generation. Primary children, young men and young women, you are deeply loved by the Lord's prophet for our day, President Russell M. Nelson, so much so that he spoke to many of you last year in a special worldwide youth devotional broadcast titled Hope of Israel. We often hear, as we did yesterday, President Nelson calling you exactly that, 
the hope of Israel, the rising generation, and the future of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. My young friends, I would like to begin by sharing two family stories. Years ago, I arrived home from work and was startled to see white paint splattered everywhere on the ground, the garage door, and our red brick house. I inspected the scene more closely and discovered the paint was still wet. A trail of paint led towards the backyard, so I followed it. There I found my five-year-old son with a paintbrush in his hand, chasing our dog. <laughs> our beautiful black Labrador was splattered almost half white. What are you doing, I asked in an animated voice. My son stopped, looked at me, looked at the dog, looked at the paintbrush dripping with paint and said, I just want him to look like the black spotted dogs in the movie. You know, the one with the 101 Dalmatians. I loved our dog, I thought he was perfect. But that day my son had a different idea. My second story centers around great uncle Grover who lived in a house in the country far from the city. Uncle Grover was getting very old. We thought our son should meet him before he died. So one afternoon we took a long drive to his humble house. We sat together to visit and introduce him to our sons. Not long into the conversation, our two boys, maybe five and six years old, wanted to go outside and play. Uncle Grover, hearing their request, bent over with his face in theirs. His face was so weathered and unfamiliar that the boys were a little scared of him. He said to them in his gravelly voice, Be careful. There are a lot of skunks out there. Hearing this, Lisa and I were more than startled. We were worried that they might get sprayed by a skunk. The boys soon went outside to play as we continued to visit. Later, when we got in the car to go home, I inquired of the boys, did you see a skunk? One of them replied, no, we didn't see any skunks, but we did see a black kitty cat with a white stripe on his back. <laughs> well, these stories about innocent children discovering something about life and reality may make each of us smile, but they also illustrate a more profound concept. In the first story, our young son had a beautiful dog as a pet. Notwithstanding, he grabbed a gallon of paint and with paintbrush in hand, determined to create his own imagined reality. In the second account, the, bo the boys were blissfully unaware of the unsavory threat that they faced from a skunk unable to properly identify what they had actually encountered, they ran the risk of suffering some unfortunate consequences. Stories of mistaken identity, presuming the real thing to be something else in each case, the consequences were minor. However, today, many grapple with these same issues on a much larger scale. They are e either unable to see things as they truly are or unsatisfied with truth. Moreover, there are forces at play today designed to deliberately lead us away from absolute truth. These deceptions and lies go far beyond innocent mistaken identity and often have dire, not minor, consequences. Satan, the father of lies and the great deceiver, would have us question things as they really are and either ignore eternal truths or replace them with something that appears more pleasing. He maketh war with the saints of God and has spent millennia calculating and practicing the ability to persuade God's children to believe that good is evil and evil is good. He has made a reputation for himself convincing mortals that skunks are just kittens or that with an application of paint you can turn a Labrador into a Dalmatian. Let's now turn to an example of this very principle found in the scriptures when the Lord's prophet Moses came face to face with the same issue. Moses was caught up into an exceedingly high mountain. 
he saw God face to face and he talked with him. God taught Moses about his eternal identity. Though Moses was mortal and imperfect, God taught that Moses was in the similitude of mine only begotten and mine only begotten shall be the Savior. To summarize in this marvelous vision, Moses beheld God and he also learned something important about himself. He was indeed a son of God. Listen carefully to what happened as this wondrous vision closed. And it came to pass that Satan came tempting him, saying, Moses, son of man, worship me. Moses courageously replied, Who art thou? For behold, I am, an a, son, I am a son of God in the similitude of his only begotten. And where is thy glory that I should worship thee? In other words, Moses said, You cannot deceive me, for I know who I am. I was created in the image of God. You don't have his light and glory, so why should I worship you or fall prey to your deception? Now pay attention to how Moses further responds. He declares, Get thee hence, Satan. Deceive me not. There is much we can learn from Moses' mighty response to temptation from the adversary. I invite you to respond the same way when you feel influenced by temptation. Command the enemy of your soul by saying, Go away. You have no glory. Do not tempt me or lie to me, for I know I am a child of God, and I will always call upon my God for his help. The adversary, however, does not easily abandon his destructive motives to deceive and demean us. He certainly did not do so with Moses. Instead, desiring Moses to forget who he was eternally. As if he were throwing a childish, childish tantrum, Satan cried with a loud voice and ranted upon the earth and commanded, saying, I am the only begotten, worship me. Let's review. Did you hear what he just said? I am the only begotten. Worship me. The great deceiver said, in effect, Don't worry, I won't harm you. I'm not a skunk. I'm just an innocent black and white kitty cat. Moses then called upon God and received his divine strength. Even though the adversary trembled and the earth shook, Moses did not yield. His voice was certain and clear. Depart from me, Satan, he declared. For this one God only will I worship, which is the God of glory. Finally, he departed from Moses. Following this, the Lord appeared and blessed Moses for his obedience, saying, Blessed art thou, Moses, for thou shalt be made stronger than many waters. And lo, I am with thee even unto the end of thy days. Moses' resistance of the adversary is a vivid and enlightening example for each of us. No matter our stage in life, it is a powerful message for you personally to know what to do when he tries to deceive you. For you, like Moses, have been blessed with the gift of heavenly help. How might you find this heavenly help, even as Moses did, and be not deceived or give in to temptation? A clear channel for divine assistance was reaffirmed in this dispensation by the Lord himself when he declared, Wherefore I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments. Using simpler words, we might say that the Lord, who knows the end from the beginning, knows the unique difficulties of our day. Therefore, he has provided a way for us to resist challenges and temptations, many which come as a, as a direct result of the deceitful influences of the adversary and his attacks. The way is simple. Through his servants, God speaks to us, his children, and gives us commandments. We could restate the verse I just quoted to say, I, the Lord, called upon my servant, President Russell M. Nelson, and spake unto him from heaven and gave him commandments. Isn't that a glorious truth? I bear solemn witness that the Lord did in all reality 
speak to Joseph Smith from heaven, beginning with the grand vision. He also speaks to President Nelson in our time. I testify that God communed with prophets in past ages and gave them commandments designed to lead his children to happiness in this life and, in, and glory in the next. God continues to give commandments to our living prophet today. Examples abound, a more home-centered, church-supported balance in gospel instruction, the replacement of home teaching and visiting teaching with ministering, adjustments to temple procedures and ordinances, and the new children and youth program. I marvel at the goodness and compassion of a loving Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, who restored the Savior's church to earth once again and have called a prophet in our day. The restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ offsets perilous times with the fullness of times. Obedience to commandments given to our prophet is a key not only in avoiding the influence of the deceiver, but also in experiencing lasting joy and happiness. The divine formula is rather simple. Righteousness or obedience to commandments brings blessings, and blessings bring happiness or joy into our lives. However, in the same way that the adversary tried to deceive Moses, he seeks to trick you. He has always pretended to be something that he is not. He always attempts to hide who he truly is. He claims that obedience will make your life miserable and that it will rob you of happiness. Can you think of some of his ploys to deceive? For instance, he disguises the destructive consequences of illicit drugs or drinking and instead suggests that it will bring pleasure. He immerses us in the various negative elements that can exist in social media, including debilitating comparisons and idealized reality. In addition, he camouflages other dark, harmful content found online, such as pornography, blatant attacks on others through cyberbullying, and sowing misinformation to cause doubt and fear in our hearts and minds. Cunningly, he whispers, just follow me and you will surely be happy. The words written so many centuries ago by a Book of Mormon prophet are especially relevant for our day. Wickedness never was happiness. May we, may we recognize Satan's deceptions for what they are. May we withstand and see through the lies and influences of the one who seeks to destroy our souls and steal from us our present joy and future glory. My brothers and sisters, we must continue to be faithful and vigilant, for so is the only way to discern truth and to hear the voice of the Lord through His servants. For the Spirit speaketh the truth and lieth not. These things are manifested unto us plainly for the salvation of our souls, for God also spake them unto prophets of old. We are the saints of the Almighty God, the hope of Israel. Will we falter? Shall we shrink or shun the fight? No. To God's command, soul, heart, and hand, faithful and true, we will ever stand. I bear my witness of the Holy One of Israel, even the name of Jesus Christ. I testify of His abiding love, truth, and joy that are made possible by His infinite and eternal sacrifice. As we obey His commandments, we will always be led in the right way and will not be deceived in the sacred name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are grateful to the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square for the beautiful music they have provided this morning. The choir will now favor us with True to the Faith. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. 
following his remarks, the choir will close the meeting by singing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. The benediction will then be offered by Sister Becky Craven, who serves as second counselor in the Young Women General Presidency. My dear brothers and sisters, thank you for all you are doing to help gather Israel on both sides of the veil, to strengthen your families, 
and to bless the lives of those in need. Thank you for living as true followers of Jesus Christ. You know and love to obey his two great commandments, to love God and to love your neighbors. During the last six months, Sister Nelson and I have met thousands of saints as we have traveled to Central and South America, the islands of the Pacific, and various cities in the United States. As we travel, our hope is to build your faith. Yet we always return having had our faith strengthened by the members and friends we meet. May I share three meaningful moments from our recent experiences? In May, Sister Nelson and I traveled with Elder Garrett W. and Sister Susan Gong to the South Pacific. While in Auckland, New Zealand, we had the honor of meeting with imams from two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, where just two months earlier, innocent worshipers had been gunned down in an act of horrible violence. We extended our sympathy to these brothers of another faith and reaffirmed our mutual commitment to religious freedom. We also offered volunteer labor and modest financial assistance to rebuild their mosques. Our meeting with these Muslim leaders was filled with tender expressions of brotherhood. In August, along with Elder Quentin L. and Sister Mary Cook, Sister Nelson and I met individuals in Buenos Aires, Argentina, most of them not of our faith whose lives have been changed by wheelchairs provided to them through our Latter-day Saint charities. We were inspired as they expressed joy-filled gratitude for their newfound mobility. A third precious moment occurred just a few weeks ago here in Salt Lake City. It came from a unique letter I received on my birthday from a young woman I will call Mary, age 14. Mary wrote about things she and I had in common. Quote, you have 10 kids. We have 10 kids. You speak Mandarin. Seven of the kids in my family including me, were adopted from China. So Mandarin is our first language. You are a heart surgeon. My sister has had two open heart operations. You like two-hour church. We like two-hour church. <laughs> you have perfect pitch. My brother has perfect pitch, too. He is blind, like me. Close quote. Mary's words touched me deeply, revealing not only her great spirit, but also the consecration of her mother and father. Latter-day Saints, as with other followers of Jesus Christ, are always looking for ways to help, to lift, and to love others. They who are willing to be called the Lord's people are willing to bear one another's burdens, to mourn with those that mourn, and to comfort those that stand in need of comfort. They truly seek to live the first and second great commandments. When we love God with all our hearts, He turns our hearts to the well-being of others in a beautiful, virtuous cycle. It would be impossible to calculate the amount of service that Latter-day Saints render around the globe every day of every year. 
But it is possible to calculate the good the church as an organization does to bless men and women, boys and girls, who are in need of a helping hand. The church's humanitarian outreach was launched in 1984. Then a church-wide fast was held to raise funds to assist those afflicted by a devastating drought in Eastern Africa. Church members donated $6.4 million on that single fast day. Then Elder M. Russell Ballard and Brother Glenn L. Pace were dispatched to Ethiopia to assess how those consecrated funds could best be used. This effort proved to be the beginning of what would later be known as Latter-day Saint Charities. Since that time, Latter-day Saint Charities has provided more than $2 billion in aid to assist those in need throughout the world. This assistance is offered to recipients regardless of their church affiliation, nationality, race, sexual orientation, gender, or political persuasion. That is not all. To assist members of the Lord's Church in distress, we love and live the ancient law of the fast. We go hungry to help others who are hungry. One day each month we go without food and donate the cost of that food and more to help those in need. I will never forget my first visit to West Africa in 1986. The saints came to our meetings in great numbers, though they had little in terms of material possessions. Most came dressed in spotless white clothing. I asked the stake president how he cared for members who had so little. He replied that their bishops knew their people well. If members could afford two meals a day, no help was needed. But if they could afford only one meal or less, even with family help, bishops provided food financed from fast offerings. Then he added this remarkable fact. Their fast offering contributions usually exceeded their expenses. Surplus fast offerings were then sent to people elsewhere whose needs exceeded theirs. Those stalwart African saints taught me a great lesson about the power of the law and the spirit of the fast. As members of the Church, we feel a kinship to those who suffer in any way. As sons and daughters of God, we are all brothers and sisters. We heed an Old Testament admonition, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy. We also strive to live the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ as recorded in Matthew chapter 25. Quote, For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Close quote. Let me cite just a few examples of how the Church follows these teachings of the Savior. To help relieve hunger, the Church operates 124 bishop storehouses throughout the world. Through them, approximately 400,000 food orders are given each year to individuals in need. In locations where no storehouse exists, bishops and branch presidents draw from fast offering funds of the Church to provide food and supplies for their needy members. 
However, the challenge of hunger goes far beyond the boundaries of the church. It is increasing throughout the world. A recent United Nations report indicated that the number of undernourished people in the world now exceeds 820 million, or almost one in nine of the Earth's inhabitants. What a sobering statistic. How grateful we are for your contributions. Thanks to your heartfelt generosity, millions throughout the world will receive much needed food, clothing, temporary shelter, wheelchairs, medicines, clean water, and more. Much sickness throughout the world is caused because of unclean water. To date, the Church's humanitarian initiative has helped provide clean water in hundreds of communities in 76 countries. A project in Luputa in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is a great example. With a population exceeding 100,000, the town had no running water. Citizens had to walk long distances for sources of safe water. A mountain spring was discovered 18 miles away, but townspeople could not access that water on a regular basis. When our humanitarian missionaries learned about this challenge, they worked with the leaders of Luputa by supplying materials and training to pipe the water to the city. The people of Luputa spent three years digging a one-meter deep trench through rock and jungle. By working together, the joyful day finally arrived when fresh, clean water was available to all in that village. The Church also helps refugees, whether from civil strife, the ravages of nature, or religious persecution. More than 70 million people are now displaced from their homes. In the year 2018 alone, the Church provided emergency supplies to refugees in 56 countries. In addition, many Church members volunteer their time to help refugees integrate into new communities. We thank every one of you who reach out to help those who are trying to establish new homes. Through generous donations to Deseret Industries outlets in the United States, millions of pounds of clothing are collected and sorted each year. While local bishops use this vast inventory to help members in need, the greatest portion is donated to other charitable organizations who distribute the items worldwide. And just last year, the Church provided vision care for more than 300,000 people in 35 countries newborn care for thousands of mothers and infants in 39 countries, and wheelchairs for more than 50,000 people living in dozens of countries. The Church is well known for being among the first responders when tragedy strikes. Even before a hurricane hits, Church leaders and staff in the affected locations are mapping out plans for how they will deliver relief supplies, su supplies and volunteer assistance to those who will be impacted. Last year alone, the Church carried out more than 100 disaster relief projects around the world, helping victims of hurricanes, fires, floods, earthquakes, and other calamities. Whenever possible, our Church members in yellow helping hands vests mobilize in great numbers to help those afflicted by the disaster. This kind of service rendered by so many of you 
is the very essence of ministering. My dear brothers and sisters, the activities I've described are merely a small part of the growing welfare and humanitarian outreach of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And you are the ones who make all this possible. Because of your exemplary lives, your generous hearts, and your helping hands, it is no wonder that many communities and government leaders are praising your efforts. Since becoming president of the church, I have been amazed at how many presidents, prime ministers, and ambassadors have sincerely thanked me for our humanitarian aid to their people. And they have also expressed gratitude for the strength that our faithful members bring to their country as loyal, contributing citizens. I've also marveled as world leaders have visited the First Presidency, expressing their hope for the Church to be established in their lands. Why? Because they know that Latter-day Saints will help to build strong families and communities, making life better for others wherever they live. Regardless of where we call home, Members of the Church feel passionately about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Thus, our greatest joy comes as we help our brothers and sisters, no matter where we live in this wonderful world. Giving help to others, making a conscientious effort to care about others as much or more than we care about ourselves, is our joy. Especially, I might add, when it is not convenient and when it takes us com out of our comfort zone. Living that second great commandment is the key to becoming a true disciple of Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, you are living exemplars of the fruits that come from following the teachings of Jesus Christ. I thank you. I love you. I know that God lives. Jesus is the Christ. His Church has been restored in these latter days to fulfill its divine purposes. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our dear Father in heaven, we love thee and thy son, Jesus Christ. And we are so grateful for the outpouring of thy spirit and thy love, which we felt during this session of conference. We are grateful for living prophets and for their guidance and direction that they give to us in this, thy son's church. We ask thee that thou will help us in our efforts to seek and act upon personal revelation as we minister and to serve our brothers and sisters around the world. We ask thee that thou will help us as we continue to strive to become more like thy Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is our sincere and earnest prayer. In the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, amen. This has been a broadcast of the 189th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.